I saw Brian Fallon, uh, who's the national press secretary of, for um, Hillary Clinton's 2016 campaign, put up a tweet saying, defund the police. That just shows you how mainstream this idea has gotten, how far left the so-called mainstream left has shifted just very quickly over the past few, just a matter of days. I think this is a really bad idea for communities of color and working class people, poor people, because at the end of the day, as you know, middle class, upper middle class people can either move to the suburbs and the urban ultra rich can hire their own um, private security. The only people who are going to be left in the urban cores with no one to defend them are, are the poor, the working class and communities of color. So this is just irresponsible beyond measure. I mean, I can't, I can't begin to wrap my head around it. America is on edge. The political polarization of the past several years has boiled into violence, looting and rioting on city streets while police stand down and the mainstream media and corporate America gaslight the public by defending violence, blaming you and I, and insisting that America is an irredeemably racist society. Anyone who disagrees gets mocked, ridiculed and canceled by a rabid mob of woke tyrants. We're witnessing a sort of societal breakdown a peek into what our society would look like absent authority and order. This anarchy is being propelled by toxic forces in our society, driven by a malevolence towards traditions, nihilism about the future, arrogance of the expert class, and a profound ignorance towards history and human nature. There is no better person to talk about these grave and important issues than my guest today on the True North Speaker series, Saurabh Amari, is an American author, columnist, and editor with the New York Post. Sorb lives in Manhattan and recently wrote about his terrifying experiences on the front lines of the riots in New York City. He watched as mobs destroyed his neighborhood, praying they would spare his building and fearing the worst about what they might do if they get upstairs and inside where his wife and children were sleeping. Sorb and I talk about how to combat the malevolent woke mob, the importance of courage, the future of the heart and soul of conservatism and how to win the culture wars, the importance of faith and tradition and his journey from living in a totalitarian Islamist theocracy to being an avowed atheist, to being received into the Roman Catholic church. Sorab has been described as one of the finest minds and writers of his generation. And if you watch our conversation today, you'll see why. Well, Sarab, it's such a pleasure and such a delight to have you on the True North Speaker Series. Thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure, Candice. Thank you. And so you're living in New York and Manhattan. I imagine that was one of the worst places to be during the coronavirus just because there was so many cases there and so much lockdown that there really isn't a lot of places to go and, and, and to leave, you know, to be pent up in a little apartment with, with kids can't, uh, can't be the best situation. And then to make matters worse, you had the sort of worst of the worst of the George Floyd protests turn very violent riots. You, you wrote about that and highlighted that in your column with the New York Post. So can you tell us a little bit about what, uh, what it's been like in New York over the past two weeks or so? So the past, the first week of the two week period you want to talk about was just the regular lockdown, um, which we've been under now for uh, three months. Um, and New York City is a wonderful city. It's it's my favorite place in the world. Um, but it's the kind of place where if you um, if you can't go to a restaurant, you can't go to the park, then it's unbelievably oppressive. Right. You have these you're surrounded by tall buildings, not much greenery. Um, and uh, you're stuck inside or if you're outside, you're just going to do pick up food or grocery shop. But that's it. You have to come back inside. Um, so it's it's been very grim. I think it's taken a psychological toll on a lot of people. I was lucky in my my wife and our, our two children. Uh, you know, we've we've made it work. They're young enough where they don't need school. Um, and we, bottom line, we've been able to make it work. And I was very lucky because one of our neighbors on our floor um, uh he moved to his house in the Hamptons, so he gave us his apartment on the same floor. And I've been using that as an office. And so I, I had a book deadline 
for much of those three months. And I was able to meet it. I wouldn't have been able to meet it but for this guy giving us his his apartment. So we've been under lockdown like most of, much of the rest of the developed world, um, like I said. But in New York, it's especially grim just because of the fact that um, the city is dense, it's tall buildings, and you don't have an outlet uh, of any kind of the kind you're used to. Um, but then over the past week, you know, we've had we had the George Floyd protests, and um, that got quite scary. Um, I, I, um, I mean, Monday night this past Monday was the worst of it. Um, I, I went out maybe at ten forty at night, just before the eleven o'clock quote unquote curfew. I say quote unquote because it was such a um, uh, toothless curfew that night. But at any rate, I, I, I went out to Lexington Avenue and I just saw. These, um, these sort of gangs of, of young, mostly young people, um, shattering store windows and just looting right on Lexington Avenue. And there were police officers there, but weren't confronting them. I don't know why. I think either because they felt they would get overwhelmed, as has happened around the country in places and around the world now, in London as well, or they had bigger fish to fry elsewhere and they just couldn't be bothered with, with just minor looting. So... Um, so then I went back inside my apartment, and then a few minutes later, we heard gunshots shots outside. Um, I, mean, I think for your viewers who, who may have heard about New York as a big, scary city, they may think we hear gunshots all the time. But in fact, we don't. I mean, New York has been um, getting safer and safer uh, beginning since the early 90s. So the gunshot was shocking. It was not something where I would say, oh, it's just New York. You just hear that. You don't. Um, so I decided to go downstairs again, but this time our our doorman said, you know what, If unless you absolutely have to go outside, it's very dangerous outside. Um, it was shocking to me because when I saw Lexington, the looting on Lexington Avenue, I thought, well, they won't come over to our block because we're sort of in this out-of-the-way block, no sexy stores, nothing, nothing cool. So I didn't think that they would come to our block. And then as soon as he said that, I looked outside, and sure enough, there were you know, young, mostly young men running back and forth in the direction. And so I decided to make a column of it. I, I um, basically spent the night with my doorman uh, downstairs at the, in the lobby as they locked the door. One of them, his shift ended and eventually left. The other one, he and I stood, th- you know, uh, watch as it were through the night. Um, and there were some close calls where these groups would stop. They would look through the glass doors of our entrance. Um, into the lobby, but then luckily each time they decided that it wasn't worth it because we're, it's just not a very, it's not a very opulent looking lobby. So they left us alone, but you know, my doorman was shaking. I was pretty, I was pretty nervous. I mean, I've, I'm from the Middle East, as we'll talk about later. Um, I've reported from some hairy places in the world, but it's, it's some, somehow different when it's in your own home in the city that you think is, is, is safe. Um, they did eventually smash two windows uh, of, a, of a salon and a restaurant and then a third around the corner a, a drugstore. Um, but they, they didn't attack our house. But I just I felt the kind of powerlessness um, because obviously we can't we can't own handguns in New York. It's nearly impossible. Um, our guard can't really do anything. Our doorman is not a, he's not a ninja, so he can't we wouldn't be able to fight back. So I just had all these thoughts running through my mind is if they decide to come in, would they just smash up the lobby and leave? Would they beat us up? Would they want to go upstairs to ransack apartments? Um, so that feeling of insecurity and then this wider sense of, of breakdown of the sense that the New York City Police Department is not in charge of the city. At that point, it felt like order had broken down. It was It was very discomforting and, and disturbing. I, one of the details I wondered when I read that column was you, you mentioned how your doormen didn't have any, they weren't armed. Um, and, and obviously, like you just mentioned, you, it's, it's next to impossible to own a handgun. I mean, it's the same situation here in most Canadian cities or in Toronto, and I know that's particularly the case. But I was sort of surprised to learn that even your doorman, I mean, they're sort of hired private security. Um, and I, I mean, I, I don't know what would have happened if a gang of, you know, 12 people who any one of them could have been armed would show up. I don't know that you'd really want to try to use an arm to defend yourself in that situation or it's better to just like surrender essentially. But is, is, is that some kind of a rule or a law that even security guards and, and doormen aren't allowed to be armed in New York? Um, <clears throat> so uh, I just 
began to look into our laws because I now want to try to get a, um, some sort of firearm in case I need to defend my family. Um, and so I'm, I'm not an expert on this, but I have looked at the application for a, for a handgun. And it's quite the process of hours and hours of training and your police department has to sign off and, 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 uh, and you have to have a, uh, a, a reason for when a very few applications are approved. Um, but I think for, for shotguns and, and rifles, it is easier. Um, but then you can't, you, you have to keep those at your residence. So, um, I, the average New York doorman is not armed. The average sort of Manhattan doorman is not armed. Interesting. Well, I mean, what you're describing is a total breakdown of, of order, like you said, and I think we've all seen it in sort of dystopian films and novels that sort of break down and the chaos that ensues, but you, you just never expect it to happen here in North America. And then on top of this, Saurabh, we're also hearing calls by these left-wing activists to defund the police, abolish the police. In Canada, we were talking about this before we went live, you know, it's not even really a radical left idea anymore. Even the National Post, which is supposed to be a conservative newspaper here in Canada, was promoting that idea on its front page over the weekend. So it just seems to me like such such a you know, stark difference from reality to what they're proposing. I mean, we had this night in New York where you had complete anarchy essentially and a breakdown of order because the police were either too timid to act or because they they were so overwhelmed that they simply couldn't and yet we're we have these people calling for sort of a permanent state of no police or or defunded police or sort of whatever they call a paradigm shift where we just instead of having policing we have social workers and civil servants doing that kind of job i mean i i just can't understand how, how they don't see the danger in, in, in allowing, in giving people sort of a free pass to this. What, what do you make of this movement and the sort of increasing volume of calls? I think even your mayor in New York, Bill de Blasio, um, is sort of starting to entertain some of these, these ideas. What do, you, what do you make of it, Saurabh? This has been a um, popular idea on the fringe of the hard left in, in the United States um, that is now shifting to the mainstream. Um, I saw Brian Fallon, uh, who is the national press secretary for um, Hillary Clinton's 2016 campaign, put up a tweet saying, defund the police. That just shows you how mainstream um, uh, this idea has gotten, or how far left the so-called mainstream left has shifted just very quickly over the past few, just a matter of days. Because Brian Fallon is a Clintonian, right? And Clint Clintonian is a byword for a kind of center-left liberalism. You could even say the kind of law and order left. Um, and so if he's saying defund the police, it just means that the activist class that's been pushing this for years has really made enormous headway just in, as I said, a very short span of time. In, in Los Angeles, Mayor Garcetti made the first move toward it where he he cut, I think, 150 million from from the LAPD's budget recently. Um, then Minneapolis, where George Floyd was killed, and you know, it was a horrific incident. I, I condemned it volubly at the time and continue to do so. There's no justification for what what that officer, was it Chauvin, however you say it, did to Mr. Floyd. Um, but now their city council has has uh, unanimously, or I think, um, with a with a with a veto proof. Majority, as I understand, has passed the dismantle the police um, uh, resolution. I don't know. If, I think Mayor Frey is pushing back against it. Even as 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 far left as he is, he knows how, how insane the idea is. Um, so we'll see how that plays out. But they're they're talking about dismantling police. Um, and as you said, Mayor De Blasio here, who had resisted such calls. I mean, again, he's pretty far left, but um, he also he's also a mayor and he knows the realities of urban governance. And urban security, um, but now he's talking about reallocating funds and so forth. Um, so I think this is a really bad idea for communities of color and working class people, the poor people, um, because at the end of the day, as you know, um, uh, middle class or middle class people can either move to the suburbs and the urban ultra rich can hire their own um, private security. The only people who are going to be left in the urban cores with no one to defend them are, are, are the poor, the working class and communities of color. Um, so this is just, yeah, 
irresponsible uh, beyond measure. I mean, I can't, I can't begin to wrap my head around it. Um, you know, at the peak when New York City was really bad, when New York was really New York in, in the, the 90s, um, we had an average of six murders a day. And through, as a result of very proactive policing, community policing, what's called broken windows policing, as you know, uh, it, we've gotten that right down dramatically. Uh, uh, to to where it's yeah, you know the murder rate is 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 less than one a day fewer than one a day um, so those are police officers NYPD officers who are saving black lives there are many more black lives saved by policing than are killed in these rare instances where there seem to be unjust killing and what activists don't talk about is what what uh, uh, all people, but especially vulnerable people, the poor, communities of color, need, which is in order for them to thrive, to begin to move forward with their lives, they need basic order, and they shouldn't have to live at the mercy of criminals. Uh, and the data just shows, you know, this, since this wave of um, uh, broken window style policing took off in the United States, at least, beginning in the early 90s, and especially its greatest test case in New York, uh, violence has gone down, armed robbery is down. Rape was going down. Uh, uh, all sorts of violent crime were going down. And who is the beneficiary of those, but not especially not black lives? Um, so they, they don't have a basis in the, in the data for what they're calling for. They don't have a basis for it in reason. It's completely irrational. Do they, do they mean abolish police altogether? How is, is a social worker, a case worker, a psychologist, how is he or she going to catch murderers? How is he or she going to confront drug dealers? How is she going to confront um, uh, uh, you know, robbers and burglars and gangs? So it's so bonkers. I mean, I, I almost, I'm, I'm, as I sh I, I'm happy to bring data as we just did, but I, I just can't begin to, to fathom why anyone would think this is a good idea. Yeah, I agree. It just seems so trendy and reactionary and sort of boiled down to our sort of hashtag culture where, you know, it's, it's a slogan, it's an Instagram post, and you have enough sort of critical mass that agree. And, and then you sort of have the, the corporate boards saying, yes, we agree too, because we don't want to lose business. And we don't want to appear like we're not on the right side of history here. I, I, I think that's the same trends driving it that drive the sort of cancel culture. And we've also seen here in Canada, a lot of instances of the sort of can cancel culture at play over this, uh, one of the former leaders of a, of a former conservative party went on the CBC and said that there's no systemic racism in Canada, and he swiftly got fired or he resigned from the, the few corporate boards that he was sitting on, and he's no longer, uh, he, he said he's no longer commenting in political life anymore because the backlash has been so severe um, over what was really a pretty uh, straightforward argument that most Canadians would probably agree with, but in this moment, um, you know, everyone's walking on eggshells and, and you can't say anything that goes against what the mob says. So I think this, this leads to a question I have about something that I, I don't know if you created or, or if you're just sort of the one that's uh, popularizing it. But you recently um, took the courage pledge on social media, on Twitter. Yeah. And uh, I think it's a wonderful yeah, message. So, so maybe you can elaborate a little bit on what the courage pledge is and what it means. Yeah, I mean, I, you know. Post the riots, I began to see the sort of stuff we were just talking about, Candace, the um, rush to destroy people's careers um, uh, and to silence them, to shut them out of the public square for thinking wrong thoughts, whatever they may be. For for a quarterback here, um, Drew Brees is just is just saying like I defend the flag, um, and he's come under enormous pressure. For saying I defend the American flag or for standing up for the American flag. Um, and so what I worry is that people, ordinary people, will come under pressure to either be to be silent or to proactively mouth slogans or um, uh, make symbolic gestures uh, that they don't believe in. Um, so, uh, and, and the fact is that most American conservatism, I don't know about Canadian conservatism, but much American conservatism has always been concerned with repression meted out by the state, by public actors. Um, 
But the sort of censorship and pressure we're talking about is not meted out by the state. It's often, it happens um, uh, on the digital public square, which is privately owned by large corporations. Um, and it involves private actors like people's employers, large corporations, you know, um, you didn't make X, Y, you didn't make X, Y, Z statement in support of, let's say, this abolish police movement. And your failure to say something suggests that you're complicit, you know, racism or, or uh, uh, police, uh, you know, uh, uh, violence or so forth. Um, uh, that's a pretty scary, scary place to be. And, and the kind of typical conservative libertarian methods of trying to resist it don't work because those often have to play out in the in the courtroom where you have, for example, a constitutional right to free speech. But if your employer under pressure from an activist few uh, uh, or just for whatever reason decides to punish you for, for, for example, objecting to the idea that you are a racist, even you, you know in your heart you're not a racist, but they call you a racist and you have to sort of accept it. And if you reject it, you lose your job or you're demoted or whatever. There is no constitutional defense against that. Um, and so, and it all happens very quickly. And so I'm just worried about Americans losing their rights under press of largely private forces. And this is something conservatism, uh, you know, I've been pushing to try to change how conservatives think about this stuff. But much of the conservative uh, world hasn't thought this through and doesn't have a defense for it. So I think in the long term to come up with political solutions where uh, private actors can't um, uh, uh, engage in this kind of censorship. And there's, um, in terms of how to do it, we can get to the nitty gritty. Um, and there are people who are better placed than I am to think about how to do it legally speaking. But in the long term, we should do that. But in the meanwhile, we need a kind of politics of courage and solidarity of the kind that sustained you know, the dissidents I admire, uh, people like Natan Sharansky under the Soviet Union or uh, Alexander Zolzhenitsyn or, or and, and others of the kind who said, no, I will not, I will not live by lies. I will not, I will not put up that, that sign in my greengrocer, you know, the Václav Havel's famous um, essay about the greengrocer who's in a communist state, he has to put out a sign that says workers of the world. United. He, of course, doesn't believe that the party by then no longer, the communist party no longer believed in it. But there was this pressure to put it up. And it's just your acquiescence that you are, uh, uh, you will mouth the official slogans, whether you believe in them or not. That's the kind of spirit I think we need now against this kind of um, woke totalitarianism. And so I came up with this pledge very quickly just on Twitter because I, I just don't want to see people... Uh, because the more of us capitulate, the stronger the, that these forces get. So I, and the, the precepts are very simple. Um, you, you can look it up on my Twitter account. It's twitter.com slash Sorab Amari, S-O-H-R-A-B-A-H-M, like Mary A-R-I. Um, and it begins with the premise. It begins with the premise that I believe in the inherent dignity of all human beings. For me as a Christian, that's, that's, um, that's built into my worldview uh, through through um, Genesis uh, 127, uh, that, that God made man and woman in his own image. Um, uh, so that's that just should make it clear that this is not about being obnoxious or inflammatory. Uh, this, you know, uh, the, what happened to George Floyd truly was a horrific thing that cries out for justice. And... Uh, uh, and, and racism is real. There is such a thing as racism. And so I'm not at all suggesting that any claims about racism are just bogus wokeness. There is such a thing as racism and it, it is abhorrent. But that said, you know, we shouldn't we shouldn't submit to outrage mobs online. Uh, we should join them, even if it's satisfying, even if it's a cause that you believe in. Think about whether or not it's worth it to join the mob, because every time you do it, the mobs get a little bit stronger. Um, it, it says, I, I will stand for the truth, not this idea of my truth or your truth, which is which is a kind of postmodern nonsense. Either something is true or false. Yeah, um, yeah like we have personal experiences 
and you can have my experiences or whatever, but, but that doesn't make it objective truth. There is a difference between the truth and what, what people like to say now, which is my truth, which you know, is a fun truth, concept. Right. Often it's when it runs against empirical reality is when they say it, right? Like they've made an accusation that's, that's, that's failed to persuade people because of the factual deficiencies and they'll insist, well, it is my truth. No. <laughs> um, you know, I will not hang that office sign, uh, that sign on my office door I'll, or make that symbolic gesture, whatever it may be, if I don't believe in the message. Now, for example, I've been very moved by some of these gestures of people kneeling. You might be surprised. Uh, you know, I saw last night, a, a, you know, police officers washing the feet of black activists. Now, this country does have, the United States does have a history of really brutal, systematic, de jure, racial injustice, slavery, discrimination. And so it's kind of collective gestures, if they're voluntary, is very beautiful. And for a Christian, you can't help but notice the kind of Christian, uh, almost liturgical aspect to it. But the kind of forced quality, you do this, otherwise you lose your job. You do this, otherwise you're socially ostracized. You do this, otherwise you lose all your friendships. You do this, otherwise you lose your right to speak in the public square. This is, is wrong and terrifying, and we should have the courage to resist that. Um, and so on. So that's, that's basically... I don't know if it will start a movement or whatever. It may just peter out as a hashtag in 48 hours. But I just felt like I needed to buck up myself and my fellow Americans because I sense a kind of Jacobin march. And and, uh, uh, and I don't want to live in fear. I'm a responsible voice in the public square. I'm not a, I'm not a, flame, I'm not a bomb thrower. Um, uh, but if I have an opinion, I've, I've thought it through, I, you know, I don't want it. And the thing is people like you and me, Candace, as you know, we, we can withstand it, right? We can, we can withstand it. But I worry about people who are like me, a well-intentioned, you know, not racist, not bad people at all. They just have come to a different conclusion on a matter of public concern, but they feel like if they voice it, they lose their livelihoods. And I don't know what to do for those people in the long term. Like I said, I think we need some political solutions um, that will run against the typical conservative, you know, free market, rah, 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 uh, ideology that we've had on the right for the past 40, 50 years. But in the short term, we need a kind of spiritual energy and a, and a spiritual courage. Well, I definitely commend you on that, Sarb, and I, I encourage all of our viewers and listeners to, to go check it out and consider taking this this pledge because I, uh, we've seen it happen so many times up here in Canada. I know it happens all the time in the U.S. where someone says something sensible, but maybe you know not the most in, not the most articulate way, but you know they mean well, and and nonetheless they get their whole livelihood um, and their life destroyed in, in ways that you can't really imagine. Um, how, how terrible it would feel to, to be mobbed by, uh, you know, a, a gang of people who have no interest in, in uh, taking a good faith interpretation of what you're saying. All they care about is their next victim. Um, well, I, I think this leads up nicely sort of to uh, another thing I want to talk to you about, which was just sort of the state of conservatism in, in America, but it also impacts uh, what's going on up here in Canada. Um, you, you wrote a pretty high profile essay last year called Against David Frenchism. Now, for, for viewers and listeners who don't know who David French is, uh, I'll, I'll try to characterize him in a, in, in a, in a sort of general way. Um, you know, he's an evangelical. He writes for the National Review. He was part of the sort of never Trumper movement. I think he leans more to the libertarian uh, side of things. Um, but but anyway, you, you, you just sort of said, you know, we're... Uh, we're experiencing like a five alarm cultural fire here and we, we don't really have the patience or the, the time to be led by these sort of, uh, I, I, I don't want to misqualify what you said, but but sort of, you know, uh, you're opposed to this sort of genteel conciliatory conservatism um, that's led by libertarians. So c c can you explain a little bit more about what your issue is with David French and, and what your what, what your sort of call to action was about the sort of spirit? Well, I mean, I think... I think Look, the, the essay against David Frenchism came out so a year ago, and there were uh, it was it, it was famously described as the essay that la launched a thousand think pieces. And so, if you want, you can you can find the original essay, and then you can go down the rabbit hole and read as much as you want of the sort of commentary it generated. So, um, I, so I will put it in general terms where I think 
conservatives like me part ways with the old, largely libertarian consensus. Um, uh, and it is this, that, that all politics right understood, look at our classical Greco-Roman tradition and then the Christian tradition, politics aims at, at securing the substantive common good. And uh, uh, whereas we've had in, in the United States, especially, but around the West, a consensus really emerged, I could say, with the, the advent of, of liberalism maybe 300 years ago or so. Um, uh, but it's become too dogmatic, especially in the post-war years, where politics is only about uh, uh, maximizing individual autonomy. Um, and there is a sense that we don't know what the good is. What is the good of? What are the goods proper to families? What are the goods proper to churches? What are the goods proper to political communities? And it reduces all disagreements to issues of rights and procedure. If the procedure is is sound, then even if the substantive outcome is horrible, um, it's okay. Um, uh, and, um, so, for example, I mean, I, I would mention. Um, you know, the explosion of, of, of pornography, right? Which is something we don't talk about. And conservatives kind of gave up on it um, in the U.S., certainly. I don't know about Canada, uh, uh, in Europe as well. I mean, there are attempts to push back. But on the whole, um, you know, a very extreme account of free speech um, that wouldn't have passed muster with the framers of our Constitution. Uh, it is really of recent vintage, I would say 50 years ago. Um, has uh, has come to permit ever more extreme pornography and ever more, you know, children, you know, to show you know, my son who's, who's now three years old, statistics show that by the, before he hits puberty, there's a 90% chance he'll have encountered hardcore pornography. Now that, you don't need to listen to me. I'm okay. I'm a, I'm a Catholic and a conservative, but you don't listen to me for that. You can look at what the data shows about how pornography wires the brain, uh, disturbs children, so on and so forth. But a kind of conservative consensus has made its peace with it because it wants to in maximize individual autonomy. And so I, and I think a wider cohort of mostly young, mostly, but not entirely Catholic conservatives, are looking back at this older tradition of, of Cicero and, and um, St. Augustine and Thomas Aquinas, where we think about politics as the quest, as the common quest for the good, the good being something knowable. It's not something subjective that, you know, I think, I think, you know, that, that Satanism is good. You think, you know, uh, 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 Islam is good and, and you think nihilism is good, whatever. We can all just, you know, that the good, uh, it's certainly political goods are knowable. Um, and therefore legislatable. Um, and I think a secondary line of thought in our way of thinking is that precisely some of the things that, that worry our libertarian friends, uh, the repression that they worry about, rightly, and we do too, we just talked about the Courage Pledge, is oddly enough a product of a kind of disordered, excessive account of individual autonomy. Right. So, for example, you can look at the transgender issue and, um, you know, it began as the as a, uh, a quest for people, a, a very small number of people who suffer from gender dysphoria, where their um, interior sense of who they are doesn't match their physical sex, embodied sex. Um, and so you, you, know, you have to big surgeries emerge. 70, 60 years ago, that we had the first cancer of surgery and so forth. But at some point, the quest for, for autonomy for these people became uh, at, came at the expense of, of, uh, of historic freedoms for the majority, right? So, for example, it wasn't enough that so-and-so be allowed to transition, but you, Candace, in your heart of hearts, have to express the belief that that person is not only a person who identifies as the opposite sex and has transitioned to the opposite sex, but was the opposite sex all along, which is this bizarre Orwellian weird retroactive changing of someone's, someone's sex where we begin. And then this language became of sex that signed at birth as though 
you know, XX and XY chromosomes are somehow a suspect category. And it re you really are um, truly yourself when you come to decide what your sex is, as opposed to something that you inherit from nature. It's the excess of liberty that's come to, in this case, actually threaten your, your, our, our freedom. Or you could say, for example, the example we just talked about, uh, the excess of, of power, uh, of autonomy for corporate actors has actually come to narrow and stifle real freedom of speech in our public square. Um, and so on. I mean, I can come up, come up with other examples, but the point is this, that somehow the, the, the working out of the original liberal idea of, of maximizing autonomy without limits, without a conception of the good that you would inherit from, from religion and classical philosophy has become itself a kind of source of oppression. And so I think there's a cohort of conservatives, of which I've just won, who are beginning to rethink some of these things. And, you know, they use different labels, you know, um, post-liberal is a term that's, that's in favor. But I, look, I think the past year or so, but especially the past three months or so, has given has been is been a boon for for that view, right? Because look look at the dogma of free trade. The dogma of free trade was unquestionable on the American right, um, and now you see you see the working out of its effect. Um, we we broke down every barrier to trade with a Chinese communist regime, and the ultimate result was that we became imprisoned in our homes due to a, a Chinese virus. Um, so again, you see how the um, the idea of f freedom or liberty without limits, without barriers, paradoxically leads us to being to losing authentic freedom. So I think that's broadly speaking is 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 my pitch for a new kind of conservatism. I I, I think it's it's brilliant. You've talked about a lot of things that I, I, I've been thinking about too, like sort of initially, you know, when I was in university and when I was younger, I would think of sort of the left being oriented towards focusing on equality and the right as being oriented towards focusing on liberty and freedom. And, and, and then it wasn't until Jordan Peterson came along and I started really listening to his lectures and reading his books that, that, that he, I sort of saw a different problem identified. I think it's the same one that you're, you're talking about, which is that the right shouldn't solely be focused on maximizing liberty because then, yeah, you lead to some of the things that you're concerned about, like drag queen story hour at, at libraries, focus at children or, or, you know, telling little kids that they can choose which, which gender they, they choose, um, you know, based on how they feel. Um, and, and it is sort of, you know, we need to orient more towards, like, we've talk, like you've talked about order and, and finding purpose and, and, and mm -hmm. responsibility and all these sort of greater goods that, it kind of came out of fashion. So I, I think there is a, a movement, especially among young people who, who are desperate for, for these kind of lessons to be taught because they've just never really heard them before. They've never really heard someone say, you know, that there is a sort of a deeper purpose and, 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 you know, you need to find, you need to fulfill your life through responsibility and purpose, not just through making yourself happy and, and finding things that make you feel good. So I, I, I definitely applaud you for, 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 kind of speaking out and, and trying to articulate this this second uh, this new path I mean with 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 mr. Peterson I mean I, I have I, I confess I haven't read his book but I've, I've watched his his videos and so forth and you just see particularly a kind of cohort of young men who've never been told about moral purpose who've never been told about or you know the good of order order orderliness is a good thing it's not it's not order is a is the friend of true freedom it is not its enemy Right, because it 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 order allows true freedom to emerge and liberates us from chaos in which you can't find real freedom. Um, and you know, I, I mentioned him particularly, even though I, I am deeply engaged with his work. But there's a reason, sort of, however many millions of, of copies of books he sold, mainly to to um, I would argue the children of of 1968 boomers who heedlessly tore down all sorts of barriers in the name of individual autonomy in, in, in the aftermath of 1968. And, and their children and their grandchildren are now the worse off for it because they, they, don't, they don't have a sense of well, what is the good life? Where is my stable ground? Because in order to really make a free choice, you have to have this sense that you stand on stable ground and 
that there is a sort of path stretching behind you and stretching ahead. So you're in continuity with something, some tradition, some vision of the good. Um, and then you can make a, a, a genuinely kind of free act. If you're just constantly told to keep your options open, then you actually don't exercise your freedom. You're just always, um, and that's why you see, I think, in my cohort and younger, well, these people who, you know, they're, uh, they've been dating for eight years. What are you doing? Are you going to get married or not? You know, I've got to keep my options open. You know, they, so you're not actually exercising your freedom. Your, your freedom is always in a kind of potential state. It's because as a society, we don't, we don't say what's, what is the right path. We just say any path is right. Well, yeah, and just try to keep, maximize your freedom for as long as you can. And then before you know it, you're sort of, you're in midlife and disappointed and, and angry. Um, so again, there's, I think there's, there's a, a real ferment and we should welcome it. We'll see how it all plays out. Meanwhile, with, with, yeah. Absolutely. And, and even, I mean, the, the sort of the movement behind Jordan Peterson is, is, is a lot of people who are sort of apolitical. They're not people like you and I that are very tapped into the culture wars and, and every single issue. They're people who sort of don't, didn't, didn't really engage. And I think obviously we saw some kind of a backlash uh, with the election of, of Donald Trump in 2016. And you recently put on Twitter that uh, we sort of have the perfect, uh, this is what you said, we have the perfect ingredients for another massive wave of backlash, backlash politics and the perfect villains, rioters, corporate, corporate woke tyranny, public health experts who turned out to be left ideologues, mobilize. So what, what, what exactly do you mean by mobilize and what do you, what do you foresee in the, in the next sort of uh, backlash here? Well, I mean, I, I just think that, you know, ever since maybe Brexit was the first real explosion, you've had um, a, a successive wave of political movements that try to challenge the kind of liberal consensus of the left and right that we've been living with um, since the end of the Cold War, arguably since the end of World War II, um, where there are movements that emphasize the communal good. They, they're populist. They want to tame corporate power often. Um, and I think Donald Trump capitalized on that. Uh, various uh, conservative and national conservative nationalist and Christian Democratic parties in, in places like Hungary and, and Poland and, and, and uh, even Brazil are rode that wave to power. And I just think that the current situation, where um, it was the free traders in some ways that gave us this virus by by uh, but creating the kind of borderless world that they created. Um, and by empowering China, by uh, welcoming it into every institution and thinking that that would reform the Chinese regime, but clearly it didn't. They just made our societies more susceptible to China's uh, way of life and its pathologies, uh, its political pathologies. Obviously, the Chinese culture is a, is a tremendous culture that I admire, but it does have its political problems. Um, you know, and then you had a, a lockdown um, you know, for which we suffered all, we all suffered greatly. We were told it was all, um, uh, so that we could, we're all in this together was the slogan. Um, so you should forego having more than 10 people at your grandmother's funeral. You should forego, you know, children should be out of school, all, all the pain that it imposes on parents, all this suffering. Uh, and at the, at the slightest protest for people who wanted to reopen their businesses were called, you know, the worst things. And then you have a uh, you have a left wing protest, and immediately all the all the public health authorities <laughs> turn on a dime. And and no protesting is the greatest thing you can do, even amid a pandemic. Um, all this should fuel it, it. It should fuel the kind. I think it will continue to fuel the kind of politics that um, that Brexit and Trump uh, set off or launched in the, in in two thousand sixteen, but. I just worry that um, uh, the president himself, I, I mean, I, I support him. I, just, I don't think he's been performing well. I think he, I don't think he's been leading the way that he's capable of leading. Um, and I don't know, I'm not hearing these messages articulated as well from the political leadership. People like me say, maybe people like you say it on, on Twitter or in columns, but I'm not seeing them. They don't notice what, you know, and then you add in the abolish the police things. Uh, this is all very potent for a kind of uh, 
a broad-based populist backlash against against these forces, and I just want to see the right capitalize on it in the in the years in months and years ahead. Yeah, certainly. I mean, the the, the worst thing to me, Saurabh, sort of, is just the idea that you know, if if we had a sick a relative or loved one in the hospital, we weren't allowed to go and visit them. I mean, my uh, sister-in-law had a baby six weeks ago, and at first they wouldn't even let my brother into the hospital when his own daughter is about to be born. Eventually they did, but, but that kind of stuff is happening all over the place. And then suddenly uh, a hip, you know, trendy protest happens and, and, and public health experts are actually, you know, like you said, kind of endorsing it. Yeah, and saying it's okay yeah. as long as you don't shout or whatever, which is engaging. And, and also, I mean, I just get so annoyed. I just went to the grocery store this morning and I still have to wear the mask and all the rigmarole and the six feet. And it just feels like it's all broken down. What's the, what, why, are we, why are we starving businesses of customers and destroying, you know, tens of thousands of businesses? You know, they, at some point, they won't be able to come back. You can't. An economy isn't like a spigot where you can turn it on and off whenever you want. They're yeah. they're out there together by the tens of thousands, yelling and on top of each other and sweating. So, what gives? I mean, it just shows you every every kind of liberal authority is is ideologized. Every single one of them has an agenda in a way that um, uh, ultimately, I think, is very bad for them. It's very discrediting. I mean, this rage, I have a platform and I can kind of voice it. I know lots of other people who don't, and they're just sort of stewing. And it's just waiting for the right political leader to to tap that. You know, these people, you know, it's people saying, yeah, let's abolish the police. Right, right. We'll see what, what kind of forces the right can muster. Yeah, I, I feel like deep down people have to just be observing this, shaking their head. Like, you know, I live in a pretty liberal area in Toronto and I go out to the park with my son and my husband and, you know, you kind of hear the people murmuring like, oh, it's so ridiculous that Stockwell Day, who's a Canadian politician I referred to earlier, it's so ridiculous that he got pulled from his corporate board or, you know, why can't I go out for dinner but these people can go smash windows in downtown Toronto and stuff. It's like, the, you know, it really is building up. And same with, I mean, in Canada, the approach that the government has really taken is let's just let the experts lead the way. And so we have these experts that are trotted out and they're also very ideological. They were very opposed to closing the borders at first because they said closing the borders will create stigmas. And they were much more worried about creating a stigma against Chinese people and C Canadians of Asian ethnic background than they were about public safety and public health and same thing now that you know they, they flip-flopped on whether you should wear a mask or not they flip-flopped on whether or not you can go to go to protests and it, you know I, I just can't imagine how it wouldn't wear on the public even people who aren't super engaged and tapped into politics wouldn't just sort of say well wait a minute enough is enough well sort of I, I want to be respectful of your time but before we go I, I really just wanted to talk about your recent book because you have a very interesting personal story You're obviously very intelligence, interesting person, but you, you also have a very interesting background. So you grew up in Iran, um, but, but interestingly, you described yourself as an atheist. Well, my husband's also from Iran, and um, I, I know a little bit about what life was like after the, after the revolution there. His, his family fled um, when he was about 12, so it was in the 90s. Anyway, Iran is a theocrat theocratic Islamist dictatorship, and there are strict Islamic uh, blasphemy laws. So if you convert uh, and dis disavow Islam and become an atheist, I mean, you get hanged. So before we get into your conversion to Catholicism, um, let's uh, let's first talk about how you became an atheist. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a long story, and I, I would encourage people to to read the memoir I wrote about it. Um, the God of the Islamic Republic. I, I, mean, I have a him being, I had a yearning for God, as, as all human beings do, we're a, a, a religious animal. Um, and so when I was very young, I still kind of vaguely prayed to an old man in the sky that I imagined. But then, you know, by the time I was 12, 13, I only associated God with, you know, judicial floggings and, and amputations and, and, and um, you know, uh, it, giant murals of, of various ayatollahs and so forth. Uh, looking, scowling down at us, um, and I saw enough hypocrisy too, where you know uh, we would go out um, to um, you know the north of Iran, where a lot of Iranians like to vacation. You know, you would get caught with alcohol, and technically it's against the law. But usually, if you just pay the morality police, they they leave you alone, and that's just you know 
again, talking about hypocrisy of, of officials, how it damages their authority, to, to see that made me think, okay, God is just this sort of public hypocrisy that you have to put up with. And for a certain kind of Iranian of my milieu, kind of middle class, urban, educated, just to be an intellectual, to be a thinker, meant to be an atheist. Of course, you know, like you would be, uh, 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 to believe in God is a sort of for the rubes, for the provincial people. Um, and so I became an atheist, you know, overtly so at age 13. And as it happened, we were immigrating to the United States. I had, a, um, had an uncle who had settled here since the 1979 Islamic Revolution. He got us a green card. Um, so it, that kind of came to a land of, of atheism and, and secularism. Um, as it happened, obviously, as you know, America is, is it still has, as even though culture is secularizing, it has deep pockets of religiosity. And I landed in one of those pockets. And I very much rebelled against it. And I went through it. You know, I think people will read the memoir would maybe recognize themselves in it. But, you know, I read Nietzsche and it led me to Marx, became a kind of Marxist. Um, the, I, I, I read enough and had a sort of series of, I would say, providential experiences where I encountered the mass and, and I read Pope Benedict's books. Uh, then I thought myself back through grace, I mean, uh, I thought myself back to believing in, in a God and then a personal God and ultimately the God of the Bible and ultimately as one encounter in, in the past in the Roman Catholic Church. So that's the story of that book. Well, it's great. I, I definitely recommend our, our viewers take a look. Oh, I, I personally know a lot of people who have also converted to Catholicism, although uh, I would say that they mostly come from sort of uh, you know, a uh, dissatisfaction of, of different sort of Protestant things. Mostly, I mean, I have, I have it myself where, um, you know, my family is Anglican and you can just see the sort of uh, moving away within the Anglican church, away from the actual text of the Bible and actually taking positions that stand in pretty stark contrast. So you sort of have this like trendy political movement where, you know, at any time that there's something that goes against what the what, what, what the Bible says, you sort of get rid of that part and, and, and change and talk about social justice instead. And I think there's been a lot of people that have sort of had enough of that. And that's sort of why they go to Catholicism. But I think Catholicism faces the same challenges with confronting sort of the trendy liberal social um, and, and political movements. So did, do, do you see that happening, this sort of politicization of the church in, in, in Catholicism or have your experiences been... Well, I would be very careful. I would say that um, the church has a two millennial, millennial old tradition of, of of thinking about politics and thinking about political order, um, and uh, it's a very rich tradition, right? Uh, because you know, the church inherited, in some ways, the political structures of the Roman Empire, and well, how do you relate? Uh, uh, you know, a church that sees itself as as uh, the sole church of Christ, as as the, as the one uh, medium for for human salvation, with the grimy realities of 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 uh, of life in 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 late antiquity, as the church found itself, and so that tradition is, I think, um, so it's not that I would say. The church shouldn't be politicized because I think the church is is also a political entity and has spent a lot of time thinking about what is the good, what is the common good, um, how should church and state uh, react. And I just think that that tradition, um, which if any of your viewers are interested, it's a, it's a long book, but a very beautiful and enjoyable one. You can find, um, for example, in a book like City of God by St. Augustine. Um, that tradition is a lot richer than uh, the kind of liberal identity politics you're talking about. But just because liberals talk about, you know, social justice and talk about it in maybe disordered or, or stupid ways doesn't mean the concept itself. And the concept of social justice is a very, uh, is an old and noble one, right? It's, it's how do we achieve justice together? How do we give each his due, his or her due, and how do we God give God his due and how do we put, do it all in community, in a political community together? These are really rich and wonderful questions. And, and, and um, so, you know, 
I'm not one of these people who says, oh, the church should intervene in politics. Well, of course, you know, uh, St. Ambrose, uh, the, the bishop of, of Milan who received St. Augustine into the church when he converted to, to Catholic Christianity, he famously uh, imposed a uh, penance on the Roman Emperor, Emperor Theodosius when Theodosius had had a whole bunch of rioters summarily executed in a way that outraged a lot of people, uh, St. Ambrose threatened him with excommunication unless he did acts of, acts of penance, and he did. And that is a, is a kind of monumentally underappreciated moment in, in world history where the Roman emperor, who his predecessors were considered god emperors, now does penance before a different kind of god, uh, who humbles himself before a, a successor of, of, of the apostles. And it's a crucial moment in Western history uh, it, because it suggests that even political power has to be limited by spiritual authority. Now, if that's the kind of thing we're talking about, uh, that tradition of thinking about um, church and, and the church and politics, um, it is at the foundation of Western freedom, um, and it's very noble and respectable. Um, um, but if it's a kind of, yes, I do roll my eyes when some bit, some prelates in the church just sound like trendy, you know, SJWs online. Um, but my concern is to recover the notion of, of true justice and not to give up on it just because there's a kind of silly PC movement that uses the same word, justice. Justice itself, or social justice, is not an iffy, is not an icky term to me. I, I completely agree with the idea of justice. Obviously, justice is is foundational, and I think you gave a, a great example. Um, my, 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 I would always cringe, you know, I spent some time last over the last couple of years in California and I was always trying to find, uh, the equivalent that we don't have Anglican or you don't have Anglican churches in, in the U S so we we're looking, Episcopalians. yeah, we were going to different Episcopalian and sometimes they would, they would base their services off of the United Church of Canada, which is our basically, um, you know, a church is basically full of left-wing atheists, um, but, but, but they still yeah. like to go to church. So I had a hard time finding um, a sort God. of community that, that was actually, yeah, talking about the, the, the core issues like justice and God instead of just the latest sort of we've been triggered by Donald Trump and let's complain about it for an hour on Sunday morning, which is obviously not what you... Right. You, you, you can for. do that on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Well, sir, I really appreciate your time. I think that our um, viewers would really enjoy reading your book from Fire by Water. So definitely recommend picking that up. And thank you for, for lending us some of your time. My pleasure. Today. This is great. All right. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.